Welcome to La Bienname Virtual Knit Night. My guests tonight are Nora Gon and Andrea Mowry, and their test knitters, Jessica Levine and Dr. Sabrina mm -hmm. Crossley. We will be talking to you about Perennial, the sweater that I'm wearing, and Andrea Cardigan, which are featured in Worsted Book, a curated knitwear collection by Amy Gilles. I'm so happy to see everyone and have everyone here. We have a full house tonight, and that's really exciting. So I would like to introduce um, our panel. So our panel of two will be Nora Gon. She is the new author of Knit, Fold, Pleat, and Repeat, her new book that just released today. That's exciting. And we have Andrea Mowry, who is a knitwear designer and known for her iconic designs like Find Your Fade, Comfort Fade Cardi, and her newest design called Metamorphic. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so I thought that we would jump hmm. right in and just start talking about the designs from Worsted Book. So um, <clears throat> both of you have very strong design aesthetics, and I wanted to know how you guys came up with your ideas for the designs for Perennial and Andrea. So Julie is wearing Andrea cardigan. Maybe we'll stand up for a sec so everyone can see. And I'm wearing Perennial. So I guess we'll start with Nora. We'll talk okay. about Perennial. Well, Perennial started with the ideas that you gave me saying what you like to wear. Like you like to wear full skirts and something that's short in the front that really shows that off. Um, and I had some pattern stitches going that kind of looked like leaves from another project. Because sometimes when I start swatching, I just, that's my favorite thing. So I'll keep making up different stitches and variations. So I had the pattern stitch for that um, ready to go, but I hadn't used it yet. So combining those two things uh, made perennial. And then there are those additional details like the little cables at the top of the rib that kind of hide the short rows. Mm, Not that they needed so that much hiding, but that was that was the reason for them. Such a great little design um, mm -hmm. detail that's uh, along the hemline when, when the, of the high low. So here in the front, she's talking about here, the, the cables that are here, right here. Right. Um, Andrea, what was your inspiration for Andrea Cardigan? <laughs> you as well. Um, when we were chatting, I had just released <clears throat> the Winter Beach Cardi. And you and I, I think, have some of the same pieces in our wardrobe, but with some of the clothing um, companies that we enjoy. And it's a lot of like dresses, tunics, great layering pieces. And I've really just been enjoying cardies that are easy to throw on with pockets. Um, and then I knew I'd be using Corey. And since it is such a round, beautiful yarn for texture, I love baubles. I like to put them wherever I can. Um, and so I mixed these kind of twisted stitches that look like big cable motifs with the baubles. And mm -hmm. then the pockets um, are built right into the hemline. So I also like playing with that really deep. I mean, I think it's at least eight inches is the quote unquote hem. <laughs> I don't know if it's a hem anymore at this point, <laughs> but um, yeah, and it would looked beautiful. You know, we played around with after the fact, knitting it shorter. Yours, I believe you did shorter than my original sample. And so it was really fun to see where it could hit at different parts of the body for different layering outfits. Absolutely. So both of these designs are featured in my book, Worsted, and we just received the second edition print here at the studio. So for everyone who's pre-ordered, their books and have been waiting for the books we are now shipping those out so it's super exciting to have those two designs in here thank you so i think we're going to move on to zach now he's got a couple questions for you uh yeah um i have a two-part question um because uh it's it's so great having two like iconic um sweater knitters here um and sweater designers um and the two questions that i had uh the first one is kind of like how you balance um, knitability with design interest and and also how do you go about um, finding new inspiration in, in um, some of these classic forms um, and those are those are my two questions maybe we'll start with um, with Nora okay um, now I just have to remember the first question the first one was about <laughs> knitability and design interest right yeah. <laughs> I think that um, from most of my designs, I kind of rely on my 
own laziness. Like if I didn't want to do something on a wrong side row, then you may not want to do something on a wrong side row. Or, And I really like to memorize a pattern as I'm going. So maybe the first, you know, repeat of it, I do have to follow the chart, but then I really want to let go of it mm -hmm. and know it. So things like that really play into the knitability. And, and I'm thinking not only of you, but of myself. Like <laughs> if I'm, you know, I don't always knit the sample, but I'm always thinking about myself anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and now the second half of the uh, question. <laughs> uh, when, you, when, you're, when you've got, uh, you know, you, you work with a lot of classic forms and, and you're trying to mm -hmm. kind of renew a lot of these classic forms, whether it be like raglan or, um, or, or, or whatever type of sweater form that, that you're, and I guess, how do you approach these classic forms um, so that they kind of can be um, renewed every time? Cause you guys have a, both a lot of originality. For me, um, a lot of the sweaters I design are about the fabric. Like, so it's the cable fabric or the picture I've kind of drawn with cables or the twisted stitches. So I'm kind of happy now that we can design flat drop shouldered pullovers again. Cause for a long time, I didn't care to, and I didn't think they looked that great, but now they really are more fashionable. And that can just be, a canvas for the other things that I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. And then the other sweaters I design, like in the book that just came out, have to do with um, some sort of novel construction. So maybe everything's made out of squares or weird shapes or, um, and so in that case, that's the, the new thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. So that so you you'll be you'll your focus will be either from the from the point of view of the, either the 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 fabric or the construction and, and right mm -hmm. rarely both together. Like if the construction's really weird, I'd rather have something pretty plain on it to really focus on the construction part. Yeah, and that way you can see the construction actually a little bit easier right. too. Because if the cables are doing this, then uh, <laughs> then it's. But it's a little who bit, cares, right? Yeah, yeah but who cares? <laughs> Very cool. And um, uh, Andrea, uh, I was going to pose the same question to you. Um, uh, the first question being about knitability and and design interest and balancing those two those two aspects. Yeah, I think um, the best way I can describe it is again, I'm glad that I'm not the only one who comes from a selfish standpoint when it comes to designing like I very much design mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I pretty much in most patterns, I need an engaging bit. And I need a relaxing bit. Mm -hmm. And I use those two aspects where like shawls, I think are the perfect example. So many of my shawl designs have garter stitch and brioche because I want rows where I don't have to think about anything and I could just like knit away and then I'm bored and I need something that's going to challenge my brain. And so then I put in some brioche. And so same thing with sweaters, you know, I might want a really complicated yoke or those interesting baubles and having a bunch of texture, but then I might want to be able to just like relax on that stockinette sleeve at the end. So I think for me, that's what powers me through to like the end of a pattern is it has to have a balance of engagement and relaxation. Mm, yeah. So it's like alternating like TV knitting versus like this yes. knitting needs my attention. Yes. Like don't talk to me knitting and knit night knitting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can relate. Mm -mm. Yeah. And you've you've tackled a lot of classic forms, but also have done um, gone about doing some really interesting construction constructions with them. Um, and so, how do you approach uh, these these classic forms? Uh, that, yeah, that I think um, Nora said it really perfectly. With I view most things as a canvas. Like what draws my attention the most is typically color and the movement of color within a project. And so doing that by just playing with the yarn or by using texture, however, I'm gonna move from one color to the next. Um, so I think that's what kind of pulls my focus is how can I move through this garment or this accessory, whatever it may be. Uh, and I also agree with that. If it's a really complicated construction, I'm gonna do something that isn't so, 
complicated with the stitch pattern because otherwise I think people get really overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, I think the one pattern that it was probably the most interesting construction for me was the rose cardigan, which mm -hmm. was knit out of La Bienname. And I actually had to do like spreadsheets in that <laughs> pattern for people because it was like, you have to cross a cable, fade, increase on this side, decrease on this <laughs> side. And I was like, okay. I think to one of our amazing test knitters, um, actually one of Amy's friends, we came up with like this tick sheet. Yes, I remember that. Off. That was so great. Yes. It was actually a great way to keep track of where you were in the pattern. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it was like your row counter and it did everything for you. But otherwise I kind of play with either I'm gonna play with the construction and have it be a little more simple with the fabric or vice versa, just to keep the sanity. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good. It's important. Like I know that I, as a knitter, like to have a couple projects even one that is more of like a tv knitting sock scenario or one yeah. that and so it's it, there's room in the world for the rose cardigan pattern yes. <laughs> uh, there's going to be people who are going to want to challenge and, and tackle stuff like that yeah yeah oh cool well uh julia i think you had a question yes absolutely so i wanted to talk to you too about the idea of collaboration because collaboration is actually so it's super important for us at la bien aimée we love to collaborate with designers and that's actually how amy got to know you andrea uh, when mm -hmm. you guys collaborated on comfort fade and yeah. amy created a special colorway for you um so um you two work with different yarn brands, different publications. Um, Andrea, you work, you collaborate with your husband a lot as well because he's your yes. photographer. <laughs> and so I wanted to know, like, how do these different elements, different brands, different publications, different people, how do these interplay with your design process? You want to start with me? Sure. <laughs> um, First of all, it's try I'm having trouble organizing my thoughts here. Okay, um, each company brings some restraints. That's not the word I want, but yeah, but um, restraints, yeah, restraint to it, which is good because if you're asked to do like just anything, like where do you start? That's really mm -hmm. hard and overwhelming, and um, so um, the fact that maybe it's one yarn you're working with or one aesthetic or instructions are written in a certain way, like all of that brings a certain restraint, which will really help to shape something. And I, I love the back and forth of somebody asking for something and I'm saying, well, what if we do it like this? And they say, oh, but that would be add that to it, which um, actually my whole design career sort of started like that when Marjorie Winter um, was the editor of, of a magazine and, we had those days, it was like the Judy Garland movie where, um, uh, what's his name, Mickey, Mickey, whatever right. it was. Um, and Judy Garland, like, we're gonna put a uh, show up in the barn. Anyway, it was like that, like everything escalates something else. I have um, a question just to really ask really quick. When you're collaborating with like publications like Pom Pom Making, Vogue Magazine, and you've also worked for like Barocco, and Brooklyn Tweed, do they influence you on your designs or is it the other way around? Uh, probably it's some of each, but I mean, I think if you looked at the work that I did for Brooklyn Tweed and the work that I did for Barocco and the work that I did for Pom Pom, you, they do look quite different. Um, and for Barocco, I was there as the design director to sell yarn. So yeah, occasionally I could really show off like the kinds of stitches I like to make up because it's great to have some kind of a showpiece, but a lot of the things I designed needed to be simpler and easier and are really there to sell yarn. Um, and plus the yarns that a certain yarn company picks kind of detect, you know, sends you a certain direction like Brooklyn Tweed, everything very classic. And they had a system for um, writing instructions that meant I actually could go too crazy. Like, so you'll see the hardest things I've ever designed. Like um, there's one that you'll, you'll meet Jessica later. Uh, one of my <coughs> customers, she had up a picture of a sweater from Brooklyn Tweed. That's like one of the hardest things I've ever designed with three different charts and short rows in it because of where 
the decreases were, it shaped the side edge. And in order to get rid of this bulge, I had to put in short rows. Anyway, it's complicated. I never ever would have self-published that, um, but they were able to provide the support. Mm. Um, so I could do that show off kind of thing. That's interesting. Mm. Amazing. So what about you, Andrea? Uh, would you like me to rephrase the question? I can remember it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree again with what Nora had said. I think for me, it creates this other kind of creative balance. I very much have this like free spirit that wants to, I let my joy lead my knitting and my design decisions. Like what will make me feel really happy? And that's kind of what I try to gravitate for and towards. Um, but there are times when I am put in a little bit more of a box I don't like too small of a box, but a little one that can help lead me to explore things I wouldn't have explored or I wouldn't have made time for. So I think a little bit of restraint or restriction can kind of push out a creative energy that you might not have tapped into otherwise. So I like to have like a little balance there. Like if it's too much, you know, early on in my career, I'm I'm a yes person, I'm a people pleaser. And I was just like, yes to everything. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I really need freedom to just kind of cast on what I want to cast on right now without limitations and deadlines. And so as I've progressed, I've learned to kind of balance that time out. And, um, but it's really neat. I definitely have patterns that I would not have ever created had I not been collaborating with somebody who, you know, even specific things, sometimes people are very specific. And one time they were like, we want you to use this yarn and we want it to be brioche and we want, you know, three things. And it was like, okay, now my brain can like get through some of that decision fatigue. Cause I mm. can only have this little bit to work in. So that can be really fun. Ah, that's great. We actually got a super interesting question in the chat. So I think I'm gonna just ask it. So when you design these sweaters, I guess referring to the worsted designs, um, did you by any chance envision men or gender neutral people wearing them? How does femininity influence your design aesthetic? Do you have color recommendations to male leaning slash non-binary people? Do you want, do you care? Do you just want us to both <laughs> go for sure, it? Whoever wants to jump in. Um, I don't, I believe that clothing doesn't have a gender. So I consider all of my patterns to be gender neutral. Um, that being said, I do think that certain sizing in garments um, that are depending on how broad somebody's shoulders are or how deep they need that yoke, that's when some, I, extra sizing would come into play there. Um, so I think that's just my perspective on it. I think they can very much be gender neutral. Mm. Um, and I feel that way about colors too. I don't yeah. see colors being specific to a gender at all. Like, yeah. especially like I watch my kids get dressed and they are just all over the charts and I love it. So I think it can be really whatever you love or the person you're knitting for loves. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know that Nora, think, Nora, Nora that sweater, um, is it the Geiger sweater? Um, Geiger, yeah. Yeah, um, I've seen a lot of men actually knitting that sweater um, and they they did alter, yeah. I think a little bit of the shaping, but it's, uh, right. you know. It actually I, didn't have waist shaping or maybe it did have a little. So a man would probably want to leave that out. But again, that does depend on like his, Figure. Is that the right word? Is shape? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sh I the man that that I saw who made it made it longer, which makes loads of sense. And I would think that you would want to make the sleeves bigger. That the forearm of a man is most likely needing a bigger size. So you'd want the deeper armhole of maybe the next size. And all these things are true for the sweater in worsted as well, because I was definitely thinking about Amy when I designed it and her mm. shape. Um, but there are just a few changes that you might want to make for your shape, make it longer. Um, maybe you don't want the fancy hem, but why not? Um, mm. You know, why not put that in? I, I would think about the arms and whether they were going to be, the sleeves were going to be 
big enough for you. And I absolutely agree with um, Andrea about color. Like that's up to you or who you're making it for. I mean, many of us, myself included, actually my husband is like your typical New England, big white beard, suspenders, plaid shirt kind of guy. Although he will wear color. <laughs> um, he, he won't wear weird shapes. So a, a lot of us, are thinking of our husbands that are like that when we make something that's navy blue or gray or whatever. But um, that's no reason that everyone else should go with navy blue and gray, like go with what you really feel great in. I, I don't think it has anything to do with gender. There's a great question that just popped into the chat for both of you um, from Debbie. When creating a pattern, how do you balance the passion of creating and wanting to work 24 seven on it, but keeping it reasonable so you don't burn out? Work-life balance for knitwear designing, question mark. <laughs> we wish we knew the secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 40 years into this and I have no idea. <laughs> I, I actually have been pretty burnt out the last year. I had, I made the mistake of um, accepting two book contracts at once. So it one year I wrote um, the Twisted Stitch source book. And as soon as it was at the, you know, at the publishers, I had to start the next one, the one that just mm -hmm. came out and I was not ready. Mm -hmm. And then COVID hit. Oh, and, and then I was asked to be the editor in chief of Vogue Knitting. So I have been recovering <laughs> struggling with my fingertips and, and recovering ever since. So yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, I was, my daughter was eight months old when I started my business. <laughs> so <laughs> life balance isn't my strong suit. I think my work ethic is sometimes too good. And I have to like learn through getting knocked on my butt by getting sick and not being able to do something. <laughs> but I think it's really hard. I think any creative artistic person will tell you that there's this drive that is almost painful to try and stamp down when mm -hmm. you're in that zone. My husband is a musician and we both have this creative like need that when especially when we're really in that zone and we're creating something that we're really exciting about excited about it is so hard to like hit that time clock at the end of the day it's just you have to remember the repercussions of not doing it I've definitely hit burnout and got really sick and so it's like I have to every day be like Andrea you have to stop mm -hmm. <laughs> go outside like I had to make rules for myself that I try hard to follow so it's a constant you know work in progress so there's another question that just <clears throat> that just popped into the chat tips for beginning designers and I'm very interested in this too because I'm in the middle of designing my first sweater right now <laughs> so That's I would so love crazy. to hear any tips you guys have to give for beginning beginner designers I don't know where to start with that one <laughs> uh don't try to do too many things at once too many novel interesting things like know that writing those instructions, even if you have somebody else size it for you, grade it for you, it's gonna be overwhelming. And chances are, unless you're very unusual, you will hate that part. <laughs> anyway, um, some, some people really do like to design and do the technical part. But for me, that part is much more painful. So if you're only trying a, an innovation or two at once. Okay, keep that's it great. That. No. Yeah, I it's also important for, for um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, it's just also important because if you do too many things at once, then like you were saying before, when you're designing, you want to feature one aspect and not both aspects at the, uh, or too many aspects at once. Otherwise, it, it get, they kind of crowd each other out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know for me personally, I have to like, it's hard not to want, it's like when you're baking or cooking, you just want to throw everything in there. It's like, you have to, I have to constantly tell myself to like simplify, stop making this like more, you can, there's, we have lots of time to do lots of different designs. You don't have to put every single thing in every single pattern, like just kind of simplify. I think it kind of starts out with wanting all the things and then you have to like be like, okay, not you, not you. And you slowly get there. Um, I think I would just go back to, 
that place of joy. I think that if you are designing something that you are very excited about that you cannot wait to wear and have, like you're just like, you can't put it down because you want to see if it works. Those are the times when I feel like success follows because mm -hmm. that joy and excitement translates through the pattern, through the photos you end up taking. Like, I think people can feel that. So I think not worrying too much. I think when I see some stumbling blocks maybe is when we try to design for other people. I think people will like this. So I'm going to do this. And it's like, don't do it. It's going to make you happy, especially because if you're trying to like, let's say follow a trend, the trend's already done. So be the trendsetter, like try and be like, okay. So I think if we can kind of push away the noise and just do what makes us feel really good. I think people kind of see that. That's great advice. Well, I'm definitely, I'm designing my first stripe sweaters. I'm obsessed with stripes. So I definitely am enjoying it. It's like to the point where I don't want to do anything else. <laughs> when I'm like That's in so the middle exciting. of working on my next book and doing all these other things. And I'm like, ah, I have to focus. So, but thank you. That's great advice. Amy, can you show us what your, is, is, is that allowed? Can we, are we allowed to see that? <laughs> I'll show you. All right. I'm going to peek, won't tell. show you guys. This is, it's actually two new yarns that I haven't released yet. So this is like exclusive. <laughs> so I'm working on my striped sweater, but what the most impressive part is the back. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. Is that a new Cory confetti color? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he knows. He's just he knows. saying it too. He knows. Um, no. Yes, it is. It's a new color called Nightfall, which is based mm. off of Winterfell. So if you yeah. are familiar with Winterfell, it's the color that Andrea used for Andrea Cardigan in the book. Mm. Um, here, let me just pop up my, my desktop camera because it's a better camera and you can see it better. There we go. So yeah, it's um, Pretty. it's a dark blue with all these like fun neon speckles in there. And we have the next batch of ochre, which has arrived to the studio and will be going online next month. And this new batch of ochre actually came out more looking like Yellow Brick Road, which is really nice. exciting. So yeah. Love Yellow Brick Road. Mm. So Zach, I know that you had some, another question for Nora. And oh Andrea. yeah. Um, Nora, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, your partner is is a New Englander, um, which uh, and actually both of you guys live in New England. Yeah, um, we live a couple hours from each other, but I, we haven't like visited each other since. Yeah, Maine, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. I mean, my my mother, she lives in in Kennebunk, Maine. Um, so I'm familiar that that whole area of the world is is very much an aesthetic. Like uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and sweaters there as well. I mean, it's it's sort of perfect that two sweater designers would be living in in New England. Um, do does that any of that sort of you know New England aesthetic um, like does that influence uh, any of the work that you guys are doing? Or um, I mean, it's, you're surrounded by it, obviously. Well, it might tone my work down a little, but like I I will wear things that are much crazier like the sweater I have on let's see if I can show you so yeah show us. it has this sleeve wow I love it it's just love it. straight but it's really big and blousey and so I feel like I'm like almost in a costume I don't know I really like it and I feel comfortable in it but um it's not a New England aesthetic mm -hmm. um so what am I trying to say that it's not influencing me? Of course it is because I'm here and I realize, like when I go out on the street, I would wear something completely different here than I do if I go to visit um, New York or I haven't been in Paris for years and years, but like you only feel comfortable with certain things mm -hmm. in certain cities. And I remember wearing a coat that I loved when I was in Italy and I wore it on the Paris um, on the subway and I felt so conspicuous. I just wanted to die. <laughs> wanted to... Well, there anyway. is a palette in Paris. I mean, if you stand back and look, it's like <laughs> neutral, gray, black. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. so here, yeah, I love to wear black, but in New England, 
I'm trying so hard. Like this turtleneck is teal. <laughs> so wow. I try to have like a little color. Um, but I don't know. I've really said a lot and not answered your question. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I mean, yeah, you know, we uh, actually we were talking about um, this painter, um, Andrew Wyeth, who's from up in hmm. that area. Of course. And I remember yeah. there was this painting that I saw where the person was wearing this sort of iconic fisherman sweater. Mm -hmm. um, this, oh yeah, that's one of the paintings the from, the, from the Thyssen mm -hmm. uh, Museum up up in uh, in Spain, um, and you know that just to me screams New England, right. <laughs> even with, like like the beaver hat that's going on there. But right. um, yeah, I mean it's just you see you still see this all around you, especially with like the fishermen and the um, and and the 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 lumberjacks and not that you are hanging out with lumberjacks all day and every day though it sounds like your partner is I have, I have yeah <laughs> <laughs> and well and um, Andrea you just you moved there relatively recently right yeah right before the pandemic <laughs> oh my so, god tell us how that was <laughs> <laughs> well I spent a lot of time in this room. <laughs> um, <laughs> We moved here in 2019, um, so like eight months before the pandemic started. So I know some of my neighbors and that's about it. Uh, but I do, so we actually live like a block and a half from the ocean, it's right out yeah. that way. Hmm. And I walk around this little bay every single day uh, for about an hour. So I think just being out near the ocean, you know, I'm very much a Michigander, always will be, but where I live feels similar to Michigan, just with bigger nature is how we describe it. So I think that influences my work. I also, I think when I think about knitting and why I love it so much is I like to be outside a lot. And I think about how I can close myself to be out there. So, you know, I run in my hand knit socks and I wear sweaters always. Like I wear knits year round, which is why it's great to live here. Um, besides like two weeks in the summer, it gets a little intense, but yeah, I think does it influence? I think it does. I think being, I think like the nature aspect of it, I don't know anyone here though. So I have not been influenced by the local <laughs> style because I'm just kind of here on my own. I think there's a certain level of preppiness that is my ex kind of idea. Like we have, our neighbors are fabulous, but they're very much like New England and they kind of remind me of that maybe um, just kind of preppier style of the area where I could stand out like a sore thumb. I just, I, if I'm matching, I will go change my clothing. So I am not, and I, you know, I don't like blend into the crowd that easy. So I think, um, I will only ever be so influenced by what's around me, like kind of put a twist on it. Mm. So I know that Julia had some spinning questions to throw into the mix because mm -hmm. she just learned to spin yeah. and she's I mean kind of convincing me to give it a try. Well, I'm convincing Amy to start dyeing fiber. Yeah. Because yes. we need some labion fiber. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'll work on it. I second that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. If you so, need someone to test it out. You uh, got no, no. it, Andrea. <laughs> but it's going to be me, Andrea. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you after. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Andrea, I've uh, started spinning a few months ago. Um, and I love watching your YouTube channel because you give so many great um, advice, so much advice. And um, so you. I have my little spindle Yay. and I use it because like living in Paris, it's um, even though my flat is okay size, but I feel like it's too small to have a spinning wheel or like I haven't invested in any other tools to spin but I feel like I'm really ready like to step up my game you know so I was wondering if you had any any advice to you know how to become an even better spinner and like should I invest in I've been thinking about an e-spinner but I'm not oh, sure yeah. what would be best a spinning wheel an e-spinner I don't know so I really wanted to ask if you yeah. could give me any advice yeah, I mean, I still very much consider myself a baby spinner. I'm like almost three years in, um, but I do have an e-spinner and I do have a wheel. I've actually never spun with a spindle and I feel like I need to like learn that. Um, I think an e-spinner, so. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I watched once at uh, one time when I taught, there was a girl there who was spinning yarn for her weekender as she was knitting it. She would just like walk and spin on her spindle and knit. <laughs> it was amazing. I think that actually was right before I learned. And I was like, all right, I got to, I got to figure out spinning. Um, but I do think an e-spinner is great. I have one and I really like it, but I think it is more challenging for me personally to use than a wheel. Okay being able to control the speed as I need to with my feet is pretty big for me, especially when I'm trying to like slow down and plying, especially I want to be able to really see what I'm doing and how much twist I'm putting in there. Yeah. And with an e-spinner, it's like, ah, ah, ah. you know, it's just like, <laughs> and you have to wait, there's like a little bit of a lag. Um, yeah. So I know that there are tons of spinners who only e-spin. And so I definitely think it's worth checking out. Um, but this little wheel <laughs> is tiny like it weighs like six pounds and this so folds like you can pop this off and it folds up you can put it in a backpack oh so what's the reference i'm writing it down right now <laughs> this is the louette victoria okay so it's a travel wheel so it's so like i can one hand pick this up um so i do think for tight spaces if you wanted to go for full wheel I would check that out. And I think that there's other brands and ones that size. That's just the mm -hmm. one I have. Um, awesome. So I would consider that if you wanted to do wheel. But I, I love it. All right. Me Julia, too. can I put in my two cents? Yes, please, yeah. Laura. Yes. <laughs> Actually, also tell us more about your sweater, too. Yes. Oh, okay, I will. So um, I learned to spin in like 2015 or 2016 mm -hmm. and I learned on a wheel and I was really enjoying it. And I thought that I would not like spindle spinning. I thought it was fussy and who needs to know that, whatever. But I was at a fiber festival and a woman made the most gorgeous Turkish spindles, which are a little different from the one you have, Julia, but mm, yes. they have a cross mm -hmm. and a spike that goes through it. So when you're all done, you, you have this gorgeous ball of yarn that you could pull from both ends. Um, and there's something about it, maybe it's slower than the spindle you have, but I just really took to it. And oh. I started buying, um, you know, all those yarn clubs that are the, the yarn, the um, fiber is dyed and there's all these bright confections. And even though I would rather, I would rather knit in a solid color, spinning is so much fun when the color is mm. changing and you're yeah. like oh it's changing it's changing so i just did miles of this stuff and plied it together and that's what this sweater is like so every color <laughs> every color and so then I, I mixed like the dull with the bright and then striped that as i was um knitting it so to really manipulate the color i i didn't plan anything until i was kind of doing the striping and then i would make decisions as i went and it seems like one of those impossible things enough yarn to make a sweater but i was going crazy spinning mm. and um something that i noticed about myself when i started taking class which is a really good thing mm -hmm. is that i was taking joy in every little thing that went right i was like wow look what i can do and i'm so excited and i'm actually the same way about watercolor so i'm not hard on myself I'm like look i learned this new thing and i'm so excited so all that carried me through like making so much yarn mm -hmm. um, that i i got enough to make this sweater yeah, it's definitely exciting to learn something new because everything is you're discovering. Yeah, mm. right. A really quick question, or how many hours did it take to spin the yarn for the sweater? That I you have wearing? no idea. Yeah. <laughs> and, Andrew, and do you have a, an beautiful. estimate? Um, I just finished a sweater spin that probably took me a couple weeks, mm. but I think it's so depends on like how you're spinning it, how thick or thin you're going to make it. Like last year, it took me a couple months for the sweater spin I did. So I think it just kind of depends on how you're spinning it and how much time, like I get a little obsessive. <laughs> so. <laughs> and the spindles way slower. Yeah. Right? Okay. You're not spinning for speed if you're mm. spinning on a spindle. Yeah. So for a beginner spinner, what's a good fiber? 
to use like Coriadale. Okay. No, I'm obsessed with Coriadale. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good one because it's a longer staple yeah. length. It's like a good medium fiber. And so I think that's a great, great one. Okay. Good to know. When I start to dye fiber, I will dye Coriadale. So that's probably yeah. where I'll go. <laughs> said when when not if <laughs> uh, keep working on it okay um so we have a couple fun questions before we move on to our intros because i forgot to introduce zach and julia at the beginning i got oh. off flustered. <laughs> so we're gonna do the introductions after these fun questions that we have for you so um what knitting stitch is your arch nemesis Okay. The villain in your knitting story, which, yeah, that's, that's the question. We worked these out together with Zach and Zach totally wrote this question. <laughs> All right. The, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that fur stitch where you hold your finger and wrap it around it and you make all this loopy fur. Mm. I can't stand to even, I can't even do a swatch of it. Okay. Totally. Can first relate. Stitch. I don't even think I've done the first stitch. Wait. <laughs> If a fur stitch or a first stitch? Fur. So fur. it looks kind of like fur. <laughs> it loops. Yeah, it like loops oh, out and it looks wow. like a Ooh. puppet fur. Oh, yeah. stitch. Okay. Wow. I'm going to Google it really quick and try to find an image to throw up here. <laughs> it can look very cool. Um, and I wouldn't mind having a garment of it, but <laughs> someone else is going to have to knit it. <laughs> Andrea, do you have a do you have a um, a least favorite or enemy <laughs> enemy stitch? A knitting nemesis. <laughs> I know, you know, I don't know if I've ever met a met a stitch I didn't like. Um, you know, I feel like there is a time when I had to knit a whole bunch of stitches together through the back loop. And I think that was borderline torture. I think that, so I don't even remember it that well because they probably shoved it to the recesses of my brain so I didn't have to think about it. But mm. yeah, probably doing something awful like that where like you're kind of getting sweaty and your needle starts to slip and they'll only fit on the very tip of your needle because it's so many stitches. Um, so something along that line, but otherwise mm. I'm pretty, pretty easy. So like Pearl, Pearl 10 through the back loop is-, is Yeah, good. would not be my jam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, I, have a, I have a second part to this question. Which designer in the knitting industry do you find inspiring? Or whose designs that you find in, in particularly interesting today? Ah, I always go blank when I'm asked a question like this. That's horrible. Um, you can name a few. There's yeah, so you can name a few. Yeah, but I go blank like I know nothing. Like, <laughs> like I'm not the editor of a knitting magazine. <laughs> uh, I can go first and give you time Please. to think. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, pro I'm probably going to make Nora uncomfortable, but it, mine's definitely Nora's. Like I've had, I had her knitted Knitting Nature back like yeah. pre-Ravelry days. Remember yes. when we couldn't go on a website? I know, I have that book patterns? too, and I knit at least four or five patterns from it. Yes. yes. Yeah. I lived in New Zealand, and for when I lived there, there wasn't a ton of knitting resources. I did watch Sheep Get Shorn, but there wasn't a bunch. I didn't have access where I lived to a lot of things, so I had moved there with Knitting Nature, and the way that your mind works is just amazing. I think I have all your books. So my mine would be Nora. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to say Olga, whose name I cannot pronounce. Let's just Buraya. call her Olga Jazzy. I always yeah. get her yeah. last name wrong too. <laughs> I love her. Yeah. Yeah. On all accounts. <laughs> and um, Emily Green. Oh, okay. Emily Green. Yeah. They're different. Yeah. Yeah. Completely different. And there are many more, but just let me stay with that. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. We're going to include all this information into the show notes, everyone. Yes. So don't worry. We'll even all the stitches, the, the first stitch that Nora mentioned, we'll, we'll include a link to it. So. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to take a little bit, a little break here. So right before we go to break, though, we're going to do our introductions because I forgot to introduce my special co-host here, which 
I'm telling you, every time I, we've been doing Knit Night for a while now, right, Julia? And I get super nervous right before we go live. And so it's, it's like you have all these ideas in your head. And as soon as it starts, your mind goes blank. That's what happens. To yeah, me. that's exactly what happens. So I would like to introduce to you, take the opportunity to introduce Julia Taylor, who works with me here at Lead BNMA. She is my yarn support coordinator and communications assistant. And our good friend, Zachary Wilder, who is a professional opera singer and an awesome knitter and who worked at Love Me for a little while during the pandemic because that's just what happens during a pandemic. <laughs> 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 so we wanted to talk really quickly that we started a little kind of mini cow between the three of us. And this week there was a new pattern that came out by James Watts, James Watts called Pure Mesh. And we are calling our cow, I'm going to let Zach say it. Oh yeah, the hot mesh cow. <laughs> and so we ca I cast on you guys on Saturday. And so this is pretty much the body of my sweater. I'm going to start shaping for the neckline because obviously I'm knitting mine cropped. Julie is much further than I am on her. Well, because, because, uh, disclaimer, I, I was supposed to test knit this pattern and I pretty much knit only the back panel uh in a month and this is a uh, lace weight on eight millimeter needles so it grows super fast but you know i i should never sign up for test knits and i never will again <laughs> because I as never. soon as i have to knit something i cast on 10 other projects so <laughs> yeah i think julia we will have an episode all dedicated to julia's whips this is definitely going to happen. We need to talk about this, right? <laughs> I'm sweating. I'm, I, I've already started to sweat. Like <laughs> I have so many, so many. <laughs> and Zach just got the yarn yesterday. Yeah, I got so. it all uh, wound up, but otherwise I haven't started yet, but looking yeah, forward. So we're kind of coordinating with our colors. I'm using a new color. I am not going to say the name yet because this is still in development. And Julia, what are, what colors are you using? So I'm using our colorway called As If. It's a neon pink. And I'm using Felix and Mohair Silk held together. Yeah. I've got Mohair with mine too. Yeah, and I've got, the, I've got Hella on, uh, on Felix. Yeah, safety sort of orange. My, uh, yeah, it looks reddish. It totally yeah. matches there, yes, awesome. <laughs> Amazing. So extra. Okay, so that's our current wisp. But other than hot mesh, what else are you guys knitting right now? Uh, I'm sort of improvising a sock. I just finished the first one, um, and it's in a. It's just a, a sort of diamond pattern uh, that I've that I've sort of put onto here. And uh, I was thinking about actually completely changing the pattern for the second sock so that I didn't have second socks in turn. <laughs> <laughs> But I haven't decided yet. I vote yes. <laughs> Mismatch Fox are awesome. Dude, go for it. <laughs> as long as it's the same color, I think we can say they match. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I'm going to show your Instagram, Zach, because you were doing some really cool swatching today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have a serious amount of swatches that I have been. Okay, I think everyone can see this now. So tell us about your swatching escapades today. Um, well, so I had um, both Felix and Helix uh, on um, in this new color that uh, Amy and I kind of talked about uh, call that we have been sort of well, I've been we were we were chatting about uh, the color of lichen. Um, and I was like, that would be such a cool color, which is this, oop, <laughs> this sort of gray. Um, uh, gray green color and um, uh, so I in this swatch in the what you can see is that the top one is in the Felix <laughs> sorry sorry I'm like playing a story <laughs> the top one is in um, is in Felix mixed with mohair and the bottom is in with helix mixed with mohair and um, it's interesting that the color the how the colors um, change because of the gray background um, of the helix versus the white background of the of the Felix um, and so it mixed with the mohair, which is kind of interesting. The mohair sort of pushed the lichen towards more of like a, a green gray pastel. And then with the helix, there's this more um, um, argenté or um, kind of silvery, silvery aspect to it. So 
Um, I put a I put a poll up on my on my Instagram. <laughs> just, just curious to see what people thought. Um, I'm leaning towards the the helix because it 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 brings a sort of other different depth and nuance to it because the gray um, background um, uh, to the to the color. Um, yeah, gives, the the gauntlet um, mixed in. It looks it gives us like subtle nuance. You'll have to take some pictures and post them on your Instagram. Because now we're all going to be stocking your your cast on. That's going to come soon. Yeah, Zach, yeah. I will say that I vote for Felix because mm -hmm. as much I love Helix, um, it's such an amazing base, but Felix is so soft and Felix and Moer. I know, perfect, I mean, perfect, perfect. The, the, that's like the argument that's definitely for this watch because it's just so freaking soft. Mm. Um, but um, the Helix is just has a slightly less uh, volume than the, than the Helix, than the Felix. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, um, which I like for the, for the brioche kind of feeling. So, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, because it's going to be an entire, it's the uh, Les Garçons, uh, their recent brioche sweater. Mm. Um, oh, God. Oh, the, the one they like did in with Western, West, West, Wild Wind or Western Wild or... Um, we'll put it in the show notes. It'll be we'll in the show notes. Ah! Um, but yeah, so that's what I'm, that I've been swatching for. And I'm a big fan of swatching. Um, as, and I know that the two designers... On here are probably big swatchers because that's how you guys get started, right? Swatching is my life. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys do with the swatches after you're done? Do you have like a swatch library or? No, just piles of them. I, yeah, I'm not organized that way. Just oh, get yeah. rid of the them. same way. <clears throat> I have tons of swatches all over the place. I just, I, have been knitting for 20 years. And I used to be this person in the beginning where I was like, cast on everything, knit everything. And now I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna swatch all as many yarns as I can. Cause there's so many beautiful yarns out there and I'm just obsessed with mixing bases together and colors, taking two different colors to make a new color, you know? So that's kind of my, that's where I am right now. It's very rare that I actually finish something. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, you guys, <clears throat> we're going to take a really quick break for about five minutes, and then we'll be back to talk to the testers. We have Dr. Sabrina Crossley and Jessica Levin. Um, someone in the chat asked, what is the music we are listening to? It is just like some, um, how do I say this, Zach? M music libre de droit. It's like... Um, oh, um, uh, uh, no copyright. Yeah, no copyright, no royalty music that I found on Apple. So that way I can play a little something in the background. Because <clears throat> I feel I've like it's couple, nice to... I've had a couple questions concerning my sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's the it's the hero uh, Hiroko Pain uh, Fox Thoughts in the Grello. Um, it's from the Pom Pom uh, uh, magazine that uh, was edited by Amy and that one uh, right there, Stephen West. Exactly, she's got a Fox Thoughts behind her as well. So um, yeah, Leon Leon asked that question. That's great. Okay, so like I said, um, feel free to pop your questions into the chat, and we're happy to integrate those into this next segment. We're gonna bring forward Jessica Levin. And let me see where Sabrina went. Sabrina, can you raise your hand? Cause you're like not in the first couple rows. Okay, I I'll try. <laughs> Cause it'll bring you right to the front of the line. I just don't know where to raise my hand. This is embarrassing. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's reactions. Oh yes, okay. There you are. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, and let me just pin you. Voila. Perfect. So we're lucky to have Jessica Levin and Sabrina Crossley join us. These are two test knitters um, for Nora and Andrea. And we have some questions to ask you. We would like to get to know you. So I'm going to let Julia start. <laughs> Hi, Sabrina. Hi, Jessica. Lovely Hi. to have you with us. 
so I'm just going to start by asking each one of you to introduce yourself and tell us where you are from. So let's start with Sabrina. Um, my name is Sabrina Crossley. I'm from Ontario, Canada. Uh, I'm a chiropractor by day and um, a knitter by whenever my hands are free. <laughs> uh, I have three young kids. Uh, my boys are almost nine and almost seven, and then my daughter's four. So yeah, that, that, that is me. Oh, I've been knitting for about um, almost 20 years. My mother-in-law taught me when I first started dating my husband. And um, that's it's an amazing relationship with my mother-in-law. I know a lot of people don't get along with their in-laws as well, but my mine is one of my favorites. So <laughs> uh, that's great. What about you, Jessica? Uh, my name is Jessica. I live in New Jersey. I um, am from California, but I've been living here for about 15 years. I learned to knit. My stepmother taught me how to knit when I was a kid, but I didn't really start doing it until I was inspired by Grey's Anatomy in that first season when Izzy knit a sweater in a day. And then <laughs> Meredith was like at the vest struggling. And I thought, you know, I want to start doing that again. And so I, that week, went out and bought some yarn and some knitting needles, and I never stopped. Oh, that's awesome. And what do you do for a living? Um, I work at a job so that I can support my knitting habit. <laughs> that's <laughs> not perfect. That's not Agreed. <laughs> I created a yarn company to support my yarn habit. <laughs> yes, but pe people I'm think we, we knit all day, which is completely untrue. I, win. Oh. I just want that when I first started knitting, I was living abroad and the uh, woman at the yarn store, who was another American expat, said to me, you know, the way you're going, you should really start looking at the patterns of this woman called Nora Gon. And I have been on a journey ever since to get to the point where I could do it. And uh, I got there. <laughs> but <laughs> Nora has been an inspiration since the beginning. That's awesome. So um, now I'm going to ask uh, how and why did you become a test knitter? So Jessica? Okay. I started test knitting um, right after I decided I could conquer the sweater. And I did uh, my first couple test knits were for some indie designers, one of whom is not in the business anymore. And then I started got the opportunity to start knitting can I say the designer name? I started knitting for um Thea Coleman and I did yes. that for many years and I found that I became a better knitter because of it so I kept doing it so that I would be a better knitter and to help put out a you know a better pattern so that it was hopefully clear when it came out so those were my two but it really helped me understand really understand what was going on with patterns and then when I got the chance to knit for Nora I like jumped at it. Awesome what about you Sabrina? Uh, I started probably test knitting a lot uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I've, I've been a huge tennis fiber arts um, supporter and she put out a testing call and I thought why not and so I started uh, doing that with her and then with posting them on Instagram, I had a few designers reach out as well. I think um, the fact that I'm plus size as well as being fast, I think a lot of designers appreciate that. So I've been getting quite a few requests, but I've, I've narrowed down and I, I knit for, I think a handful of, of designers that I really like, really respect. And also that I, I think they do a really good job at um, designing for my size. Mm. So that's very important to me. Uh, and I think one of the main things that I enjoy about test knitting is you get to know an intimate group of knitters very well and have a sense of community within the knitting community, which is not always out there right now with, with the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. So I have a question for both of you. Um, what level of knitting do you need to have to start test knitting? Any level. <laughs> Any le I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think designers appreciate every level because something that might be easy for myself and I completely understand other testers may not with um, a lower experience. So 
even there's some things that, you know, I haven't done before when test knitting. So it, it's nice to see it from that point of view, because you can really gauge if testers are understanding it. I was just going to say that I agree with you. Um, I think that it, it um, behooves the designer to have all levels because all levels of people are going to be knitting it. So if you only have advanced knitters testing your pattern, you're not going to know whether or not a more of a beginner person is going to be able to handle it. I mean, you want to have experience of having at least finished a couple of successful sweaters before you start testing a sweater. But um, but I think that that all levels and I somebody recently said to me, you know, the really advanced knitters, they sometimes miss things because they're so intuitively going along. That's that my they're problem. Seeing, they're seeing it. And so it helps to have people that are more beginner who are really paying attention, you know, on that level. So I encourage it. Anybody who really wants to refine their knitting skills and, and be part of the process. If you really the thing is, is that I when I take it on, I like it's like a job, like if there's a time. You got to make sure you've got the time you can meet the commitment. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. As long as you can commit to that time level and kind of take it seriously of getting it done, I think you should go for it. So um, speaking of finding these test knits, where do you find these opportunities to test knit? Where have you guys historically found these test knit calls happening? Um, I've been finding them with following designers on Instagram. Uh, also, I find watching podcasts, they'll talk about new designers, and mm -hmm. I tend to um, end up following those designers, and then you find out uh, about test calls that way as well. Um, groups on Ravelry, they have call-outs uh, for testing as well, but I think the majority of mine are probably through Instagram, and then, as I said, a few, a few direct messages to myself. How about you, Thanks. Jessica? Thanks. Either I see a call on Instagram, sometimes a designer reaches out and says, hey, I'm starting up a test now. You've tested me before, before I put out a public call. Are you interested? But a lot, on, a lot of it's on Instagram these days. Nice, okay. Hmm. There's some people that are um, asking about kind of, um, you know, do like how to how 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 does test knitting actually work? Because I think it's it's a relatively um, uh, new concept for some people. Because um, and you know what? How does like the yarn work? Or like I know that certain test knitters, like certain certain designers, have the budget. Like, uh, but mm. I've always considered it to be kind of sort of like a a community service um, in, in in that respect. Um, you know, you're you get to keep the garment at the end, right? Um, but uh, but in terms of like, it's usually you, you're the ones who, who you have to find the yarn and, 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 and make all that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the design, depending I've on- I've had a the, variety the... of different- um... I think we have a little bit of a delay here. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just Good. gonna add that I've- <laughs> I was just going to add that I have um, been compensated in a variety of different ways, uh, depending on the designer's budget and means. Some will, you know, offer you a free pattern at the end. I've had one designer that, because of my size, she will compensate some of the yarn. Mm -hmm. um, I've had others that, you know, after you've tested three times, they might give you a little bit of a, a stipend at the end. But ultimately, I think designers are looking for knitters using all a variety of different yarns. Um, so people coming to see their patterns as well can see it in more budget friendly yarn or more of a luxury yarn. And it's, it's a great experience because you're able to stash bust, you're, you're able to choose what works and fits for you. So that's where my experience has come from. I have a question for Andrea and Nora. How do you guys operate your test knits? Um, Andrea, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I basically put out a testing call in my Ravelry group. Um, sometimes I might flag it like on Instagram, say, hey, there's a testing call over in my Ravelry group. Um, I do like to get a range of experience because I think I have some great testers like Sabrina has tested for me a few times and 
I think too, you get people who are used to how you write your patterns and they autocorrect. Um, but I think it's good too to define test knitting. Test knitting for me, I think sometimes there's blurry lines where people confuse it with sample knitting. Mm. The sample knitter is paid by the yard to knit a sample of the sweater that then belongs to the designer, the yarn company. Mm -hmm. And they're given the yarn, you know, they're sent the yarn to do that job. Test knitting, depending on the designer or the company or how they make it work. For me, I'm not asking any tester to find like errors in a pattern. They're not tech editing. They really just get an early copy of the pattern. And my goal is to see if they had fun while knitting it. Like, was this, could you follow this pattern? <laughs> was it fun? And if they like how it fits at the end, I think that's really important to see like, are you happy with the outcome? Um, and so, yeah, I just put up a call on my Ravelry group and I actually have somebody who helps me moderate then through the testers. Again, too, because this isn't a paid job, I don't put a strong, um, you have to finish this. Like people's lives are obviously gonna take precedent and things come up and people drop out of the test and that's just life, especially these past three years, things come up. So I give a like gold deadline <laughs> of when I would love to, you know, receive your feedback and stuff. And then there are definitely the test knitters who go above and beyond like Sabrina who take beautiful photos. And it's really amazing to be able to see how especially garments fit across a wide range of body types, heights, and all of that. So yeah, that's mm. how, how I do it. Nice. How about you, Nora? Okay, so here's where I admit that in my 40 year career, I've only run like four test nets because um, it just wasn't part of the process until wow. very recently. Mm. And for most yarn companies, especially Bigger yarn, you know, bigger yarn companies only have like 20 employees. So I can't say it that way. Like, like Broco seems to be a big yarn company and they have like 20 employees. But, but in yarn companies been around for a while, um, we depend on the sample knitter and the tech editor and checker to do a lot of what the test knitter does. So I've done test knitting for this book for Worsted and some for Brooklyn Tweed. I do see the positives of it, like people finding that it's um, something might be described differently than they're used to. And I love seeing the pictures on knitters of different sizes in different yarns. Um, the ones that I've done, I put out the call through Instagram and have had just amazing results, like so many people um, wanting to sign up for it in almost all the sizes. And um, I usually run it through Google Classroom. Mm. So I'll post new things in Google Classroom. I, I was doing a different Google thing, but Google Classrooms are like really pretty. <laughs> um, and clearer and really nice. And you can, I can put up pictures and instructions and people can ask questions. Um, so that's how I've been running the few that I have done. Thank you for that information. Cause whenever I finish my striped sweater, I need to test it. So I love this Google classroom idea. That sounds right up my alley. So that's great. Sorry, Zach, I cut in. <laughs> Um, great. Uh, now, uh, I think we should go back to our, our test knitters. Um, you know, obviously you have your test knitting, but do you guys um, both, I imagine, have some other um, knits on the other side that, that you do the, outside of your test knitting. Um, what, what are some of the stuff that you kind of gravitate towards? Um, I mean, we'll start with uh, Jessica. I'm a cabler. I'm addicted to cables. Um, I, yeah, give me a cable and I like go to town. I have um, recently started working on self-drafting my own sweaters. I haven't really thought about designing for, for sale, but I've been making my own. And those are also, I mean, I know I just sound like Nora's number one fan club here, but um, I really was inspired like by her books. Her books really pushed me to have these incredibly original and innovative cables and um, twisted stitches. And I kind of went with them and created stuff that I wanted 
you know, for myself. So I've been working on that a lot. And also, I just want to say that the other, um, there's a couple other knitters that I, that I really, you know, like that, um, that, that aesthetic, you know, that you were talking about when you asked Andrea and uh, Nora in the beginning. And uh, I want to, I have a few of them that have been so busy with other things. It's sort of like, okay, I can just slow down and knit my thing and knit theirs. <laughs> and I'm a really big fan of Emily Green's aesthetic also. So I've got a few of her um, sweaters on my to-do list. Amazing. Amazing. How about you, Serena? Uh, I would say I probably gravitate towards sweaters and it's usually anything on the hot now list. I tend to, oh, I want to knit that. I want to knit that. And I, I tend to gravitate, I would say, to stuff that has really fun yokes. I think it was um, Tin Can Knits called it Party in the Yoke. So I think that's um, where I, I tend to find my love. But Currently right now, I for some reason, I have a month without any test knits. So the on the docket is things for my kids. They keep saying, when are you going to knit me something? When are you going to knit me something? <laughs> so uh, I have two color work hats with stormtroopers on them. And then I forget what my daughter wants, something pink and sparkly. But uh, that's what I'm, I'm doing right now. But I'd say for the most part, I'm usually knitting. I'm usually knitting sweaters. And I really have gravitated this spring to more uh stuff like jesse jackie c slack does where it's um it's just very wearable uh and light and gauzy and i can wear it to work and not worry about um overheating and that sort of thing so that's where i'm i'm starting to knit things right now and zach i just wanted to add that i um, got a knitting machine recently so i'm also Yay. i'm wearing the sweater it's the second sweater i made on my knitting machine um, and I am kind of fine. I stopped buying sweaters about seven years ago. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not, why am I, why? So I'm finally getting all of the fine gauge stockinette sweaters that I dreamed of, but refused to make on size <laughs> two. Um, I'm starting to make them on a machine. So that's my other big thing that I'm working on now. Wow. Do you guys, um, is there anything that um, you guys are working on right now that you can show us, like some, some work, some whips, uh, or at least tell us in any case, if you guys don't have it right next to you. Jessica, I'm obsessing with your wall behind you. Are those swatches? I am a swatch addict. <laughs> what? Hold on. I'm going to spotlight you so we can get a full view of this because this is crazy. Oh my God. Wait, there we go. <laughs> wow. I Amazing. pulled down some of them if I, in case I had to show them off, um, but those are my swatches. I think that I got to a certain point where I stopped um, swatching so that I could get to the sweater and started swatching so I got to know the yarn and decided what it wanted to be and what it wanted to do. And uh, I fell in love with swatching and that's my swatch board. Beautiful. Thank you. All righty, let's, okay, here we go. Secret on a top secret test knit. So I can't show that, but <laughs> but I do have a, you know how you have like those lifetime goals? So one day, one day, this is gonna be a coat. Can you see it? Oh wow. That's from Nora's book. And it's gonna be like a full length coat. This is just the beginning of the sleeve. Wow, what is the yarn? So um it's Hudson and West Forge oh lovely lovely I just discovered that brand right before the pandemic and like everything <laughs> happened I need to go and circle back to that is this um sweater that I designed for myself wow also using one tables incredible so I lost Nora and Andrea in the oh. crowd here. If you guys could raise your hand really quick, I'll bring you back up front. To digitally raise our hands? Yes. Well, I just talking Andrea actually brought you up. I know. <laughs> I can do a thumbs up. Can I do that? Does that help? There, oh yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> so you got me, right? I don't have to do it. I, well, right. when you talked, you like popped right up to the okay, I don't know okay, what happened. Okay. Like you guys just disappeared and I couldn't find you. So we were quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach, ask them the last really great question. <laughs> oh yeah. The, okay. Well, we, we talked about the um, knitting villain or the stitch villain. Um, now we want to talk about what your favorite stitch, or if you were a, a knitting technique, what would you be? So Sabrina, what, 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 uh, if you, if you were a 
like the incarnation of a of a knitting technique, what do you think you would be? Um, I would say something pretty loud and colorful. So probably color work, because um, I'm I'm not a quiet <laughs> soul. Um, I I was worried that you were going to ask me what my stitch villain was because I was I was going to offend Andrea and say I really hate baubles. <laughs> <laughs> and this, okay, this I sweater like has you. a lot. <laughs> it has so many. I can just never get them perky enough, which is it's a bad thing in life. Yeah. But mm -mm. yeah. <laughs> but yes, I I I really like color work or or something with you know a fantastic cable or or something that's just um it it stands out it speaks. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I know I know what Jessica's uh, answer is going to be, but I think I, I want to hear it from from you. <laughs> A very complicated cable. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Nora, Andrea, Jessica, and Sabrina. This was super fun to get to know you and to talk with you a little bit more. We're coming to the end of our segment, so it's time to say goodbye. Um, we will be posting the replay of this on YouTube, and we'll be adding all the information into our show notes. And I think that's it. This will be the last knit night for a little while because I'm going to be getting on an airplane tomorrow and flying to the United States to start the Worsted Book Tour. So I'm going to be <laughs> tooting around, going to yarn shops and signing the Worsted Book. Um, so we'll be back uh, probably end of, we'll probably have another knit night in April. So, all right, you guys have a great evening and we'll catch you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.